Hey there, um, my name is Amelia and I'm a grad student at Dartmouth um, and I'm going to be walking you through um, this module about plants and soil and their interactions um, and the microbes that are involved in those plant soil interactions. So let me just share my screen. Okay, awesome. Um, so I just want to first start out by thanking the Joint Science Education Project um, for uh, this program um, that allowed me to create this module and, and go to Greenland um, and do some research there. Um, so, oh, I should go back uh, and just explain my title real quick. Um, dirt bugs and their friends, basically like the things that live in soil and their friends. And I just, um, yeah, I, I like this title because it's a little bit silly, but it's like also very true. So I grew up in Astoria, Oregon, and worked um, in the summers at a local national park um, doing wetland restoration. And that's how I initially became interested in um, ecology and studying soils and sediments. Um, so I would spend a lot of time um, clam digging with my mom and gardening. Um, another reason why I became so interested in soil. And uh, eventually I made my way to Vermont where I started a PhD program at Dartmouth um, and really enjoy uh, riding my bike anytime I can. Um, yeah, so like I said, I started out by studying um, tidal wetlands, which is that photo on the left. Um, and then I was able to do some research in Greenland as a part of the JSEP program. And so that's me with, the, uh, with a, a drill and a soil core. Um, and, but most of my field work is actually in the Northeast around where I go to school. Um, the picture, the next picture is at the second college grant, which is up near Canada. And um, the far right is my dog Waldo, who is a great field assistant um, and goes with me um, when I go to do my field work here. Okay, so let's just start out by looking at three different landscapes. So on the far right, that's a photo of a tropical rainforest um, in the Amazon. Um, the top left photo is um, one that I took in Greenland, and um, that ecosystem is um, a dry tundra, an Arctic dry tundra, which is different than um, an Arctic e ecosystem you might find in Alaska with like the really, really deep peat bogs. This, the soil here is um, it doesn't have that super, super deep organic, you know, peat moss bog stuff. Um, and then the bottom left photo is a high desert ecosystem in Oregon. So I have two questions or two, two um, things to work on here. One, discussing, noticing and discussing what is similar and what is different between these landscapes. And then what might be driving these differences. So at this point, um, just pause the recording and then resume when you're ready and I'll talk about some of the things um, that I might notice. Okay, so um, some of the things that I think are similar are, <laughs> might seem kind of obvious, but um, I don't think there's anything that's too um, simple or, or too obvious to notice. I mean, the, the process of, of asking a good question starts with just observing. So I noticed that there's plants growing in all three of these ecosystems. Um, but in terms of the type of plants, they're really different. Like, and there's a lot of different colors. So there's, there's so much um, red and brown in the high desert. Um, and even though that's a desert ecosystem um, or that, that's a um, like a, a sagebrush desert ecosystem and the dry tundra is somewhat similar in the amount of rainfall that it probably gets, um, but they're still very different ecosystems. So I might wonder what could be driving these differences? Is it the temperature that those places experiences? Because that could totally make a warmer temperature in the high desert ecosystem could create that difference. Um, pardon me, I have allergies right now, so <laughs> that's why, you know, sneeze or my nose is running. Um, and then the tropical ecosystem, 
looks, you know, just so different from these. Um, I do notice that all three of these places have water, you know, there's, there's some sort of river there. So I, I know that they do get water, but I would predict that there is so much more rainfall, local rainfall in the tropical rainforest. Um, that might be one of the reasons that those trees are growing so tall. Um, and so the fact that it might get more water, but maybe have more even temperatures might make it different than say the high desert ecosystem on the left. Okay, so let's just talk about um, scale into looking at two different kinds of plants. So when you're walking through a forest and you notice a tree, you might notice the different leaf color and shapes. You might notice different bark textures and colors. You might wonder like, oh, this tree is taller than that tree. Like, I wonder why. I wonder if it had something to do with the amount of light or um, and how that tree was able to access light as it grew. And then um, if you look over on the left, that's a pea plant that we might all be familiar with. And this plant looks pretty different. So this plant um, likes to grow in really high, um, high light environments. And so it, it pops up in, um, you know, like open fields or alongside roads, and it does really well in a garden where it gets lots of light. And that's because it houses some bacteria in its roots called um, nitrogen fixing bacteria. And the reason those bacteria are so special is because it gives this plant a leg up on other plants because nitrogen is a limiting resource in the soil and plants need it to grow. Um, it's the reason why you would add organic matter like compost to your garden is because there's a lot of nitrogen in that compost. It breaks down and is eventually available to the plant. But if you're a nitrogen fixing plant like this one, or you know, they have nitrogen fixing bacteria, you're able to grow really quickly and outcompete other plants. But the caveat is that you need a lot of light because um, it requires a lot of energy to break apart atmospheric nitrogen. So atmospheric nitrogen, there's two um, nitrogen molecule or two nitrogen atoms bonded together in a triple bond, like really strong bond. And so this bacteria require a lot of energy to break that bond and then turn it into a form of nitrogen that is available and can be used by plants. So these plants are in high light environments because they're like fixing carbon dioxide and turning it into sugars like crazy so that they can feed these bacteria that are doing all of this nitrogen fixing work. So all of that is to say is that these two plants have really different life history strategies. They've done really different things based on what's happening below ground. So the bacterial and the, the microbial communities that these two trees or these two plants are associated with have really um, important consequences for what these plants look like and where they can grow. So let's just back up a little bit and talk about soil in general. So soil begins to form basically from bedrock. And um, the first kind of process of breaking down rock, disintegrating rock, is that water um, both physically and chemically breaks it down. So thawing and freezing creates cracks and breakage, um, but also the slight um, acidity of water also um, dissolves rock. So hydrogen ions floating around in water acts as like a chemical agent to break rock down. So if you think about being on the edge of an ice sheet, like in Greenland, um, the soil basically has no organic matter. It's just been physically ground down by the ice sheet as it retreats. And so, um, it's you know not a solid piece of rock, but it's had that first kind of stage of breakdown happen where it's been physically, um, physically broken down. And so this kind of, um, uh, sorry, soil particle here that results from the grinding of a glacier or an ice sheet um, 
it's really, really fine and really um, slippery. And it's, it's only found where you have glaciers and ice sheets grinding, like that fine of, of a material. Of course, there's like other big chunks of boulders and things, but there's also this like super fine, um, super fine glacial till soil. So back to our photo of how you get, how you form soil. So you've got that physical, that chemical breakdown to start, and then organisms start to colonize, like lichens and mosses and things that can grow on, um, you know, just like a, a rock surface or without any organic matter. And slowly over time, you know, as those, as those organisms, those plants die, they add organic matter to the soil, and slowly you start to form an organic horizon, where below that you have the mineral horizon, um, because there's there's less organic matter, there's more minerals. Um, so uh, all of these different notations, like A horizon, C horizon, bedrock, um, they basically just designate different timelines of soil formation. So you have the organic horizon, and this A horizon we would call the mineral horizon, um, and then the C horizon is, is like that secondary mineral horizon where it's you know, maybe like bigger chunks and, and um, it's just been less broken down. So plants add organic matter to the soil in three main ways. So leaves can fall off the plants um, onto the, the um, you know, forest or grassland um, floor, and then roots in the soil also break off and die and add organic matter to the soil. But then plants themselves, the carbon that they're fixing from the atmosphere into sugars, they actually, they use it to grow obviously, but they also um, exude it into the soil. And exude just means like, like secreting, um, like they're, they're letting go of just a little bit of sugar out of their root tips and also we're going to come back to this in a little bit, but mycorrhizal fungi that are associating with the root tips of some plants also get the sugars from these plants. And they also release some of that, those sugars and amino acids and those, those plant photosynthates, they release them to the soil. And the reason the plants and mycorrhizal fungi are releasing these, um, these sugars and these amino acids to the soil is because they want the free living microbes that are living around the roots and the hyphae in what is called the rhizosphere, they want those microbes to get this like really yummy free meal so that those microbes can speed up decomposition and release nutrients that are in the soil locked up in organic matter. So I just threw a lot of <laughs> terms out there. Um, so I'm just gonna um, back up real quick and say that uh, and just reiterate some of those. So the rhizosphere, um, rhizo is like root and then sphere, I guess, is space. So the root space, the rhizosphere, is a place of a lot of microbial activity. And those microbes, um, they, the way they eat is that they exude, they spit out enzymes into their local environment so that those enzymes can break bonds and organic matter, you know, cut cut bonds so that nutrients are released because it's the nutrients that those microbes really want and that the plants really want. So that's the reason why plants leak these sugars and amino acids to their environment is because they're kind of harnessing these microbes um, to do the decomposition work. <clears throat> so let's go back to these three photos that we just did a breakout session with. And now let's think about soil. So how might differences in soil affect these kinds, these the kinds, sorry, that's a typo, the kinds of plants growing there. Um, how might the different plants affect the soil? So uh, again, pause the video now and head into your breakout groups to talk about these questions um, for, you know, five, seven minutes or so, um, however long you need, and then um, resume the video and I'll discuss some of the things that I thought about. <clears throat> so I was wondering because the Arctic dry tundra 
is really close to an ice sheet. So it has pretty new soil, right? When we're thinking about like the timeline of soil, like it just takes a long time for soil to break down. So I'm wondering if maybe one of the reasons there aren't super tall trees here, like in the Amazon, is that it could be that the soil is just not deep enough or broken down enough or that the permafrost there prevents trees from growing. Um, and then um, a reason why in the soil, why the Amazon um, has these tall trees, um, maybe it has something to do with the amount of nutrients in the soil. Um, and then for the high desert, maybe there's something going on with the amount of organic matter and you know the rate at which plants are able to grow there if they're limited by water. Maybe there just isn't as much organic matter and so things just grow really slowly there. One thing I will say about the Amazon, I do know that Amazonian soil is really, really old. So it's been through this process called weathering, which we looked at a couple slides back, you know, the process of soil breaking down is weathering and releasing those minerals into the soil. Amazon rainforest is, is old. So there's actually not that many nutrients in the soil, which is really counterintuitive. Like how could there be these amazing, amazing, huge forests there when the soil is super thin doesn't have many nutrients and most of the organic biomass is above ground. Um, and the reason the Amazon forest exists like this is because they have such a rapid decomposition rate. So when anything falls to the forest floor, it's decomposed super quickly and the nutrients are recycled super quickly. So if, if you think about like, if you leave a, you know, some sort of food outside of your fridge and it's warmer out there, you know, relative to your fridge, um, warmer on your counter or whatever, it, it gets kind of moldy or like, you know, stuff starts to grow on it. And that's because microbes can work quicker when it's warmer and they can also work quicker when it's wetter. And those are two things that the Amazon has going for it. So decomposition is so fast that stuff in the soil is turned over and reabsorbed by the plants um, growing there, which is, I think is super cool. There's so much going on in soil. Um, okay, so um, we're gonna take a, just like a, a two minute um, self, uh, like an ind independent um, thinking break to think about what plants need. Um, so just, you know, pause, pause the video for a minute or two um, and everyone write down a few things that you can think of that plants need and then resume when you're ready. Okay, so uh, some of the things that I thought about are, um, you know, maybe somewhat obvious and some of them maybe not. So Plants, of course, need sunlight. And that, you know, of course, might seem obvious, but when you think back to our like tree versus pea plant analogy, sunlight is really important in that distinction in where those plants can live. Um, water is also really important. So like those species in the Amazon couldn't grow anywhere else because they need that rapid decomposition that is afforded to them by how wet it is. Um, and then I also thought about some nutrients in the soil. Nitrogen, I've already talked about, can be fixed from the atmosphere. Um, and it's also in dead organic matter that enters the soil. And so nitrogen can be broken down in the soil or it can be added to the soil from the atmosphere. But then another really important nutrient is phosphorus. And phosphorus isn't in our atmosphere. It can only come from dead organic matter that's being recycled to, for plants to gain phosphorus. Um, but originally it comes from the bedrock. So if you think back to that four paneled photo of how you get soil through weathering, um, phosphorus is released from secondary minerals by um, chemical weathering. And so um, it's, it really depends on where um, in the world you're, you're thinking about in terms of like where phosphorus comes from. So like in the Amazon, 
phosphorus doesn't come from the soil anymore because that soil is so old that it can't be weathered from the bedrock anymore. And so actually a lot of the phosphorus, like the, it's so limiting in the tropics, like, but the, but the phosphorus that does enter that system actually comes from dust storms from the Sahara. So dust from a desert comes over in a, you know, a storm or a cloud and is deposited in tiny amounts over the Amazon, but it's still super important in the plant productivity there. Um, but in other places, phosphorus can still be released from the parent material. And um, one of the ways that plants gain these nutrients, both phosphorus and nitrogen, is by enlisting help from a special type of soil organism um, called mycorrhizal fungi. And if you've never heard of mycorrhizal fungi, that's okay. I didn't learn about them until I got to college. And, uh, and now I study them uh, in a PhD program. So, you know, go figure. Uh, so mycorrhizal fungi, um, the general definition is that they have a symbiosis with plants. And symbiosis means living together. And this particular type of symbiosis is called a mutualism, which means that both parties benefit. A parasitism is also a symbiosis, but it's where one party benefits and the other one is actually harmed, um, like, uh, like, like head lice or something like that, right? Like the lice are living off of your blood or you know whatever um, on your head and you're obviously not gaining anything from the situation. You're actually being harmed because it's you know, super uncomfortable. Um, anyway, so um, there are a couple of main types of mycorrhizal fungi, but all of them associate with the root tips. And so I'm just going to use this little laser pointer. Um, so this zoomed in box right here um, is showing that the plant roots are linking up with the fungus roots. And these fungus roots are called hyphae. They have a special name. And this mushroom that you're seeing is the fruiting body of a fungus, of a mycorrhizal fungi. So when you see a mushroom out in the forest, it's actually the reproductive structure of that fungus. Most of the fungus's life and biomass is in the soil, but occasionally when it, you know, crosses with another fungus, it'll send up a fruiting body which releases spores and hopefully spreads that fungus to new areas. Um, so underneath the soil, there is a whole lot more going on with this fungus. And so this mycorrhizal fungi is um, associating with the root tips of this plant. And so you can see that this root tip here is kind of orange. And then there's this white kind of casing over the root tip. Um, and so this is called the hyphal sheath. And so the hyphae of this ectomycorrhizal fungi is kind of making this sheath around the root tip and that's the interface where the plant gives the mycorrhizal fungi sugars and the mycorrhizal fungi gives the plant nutrients that it's um, gone out and scavenged from the soil. So I, I will say that this is, if you go out and you can find a species of plant that associates with an ectomycorrhizal fungi and you pull up some roots, like you'll be able to usually see these with your eyes, which is super cool. Like you can't see the hyphae because they're so small and thin, but you can see the root tip with this, um, this hyphal sheath. Uh, I call them nubbins because they, they make the root tip have this special morphology. It gets kind of, it's kind of short and like stumpy and just like looks like a nubbin, I don't know. Uh, but there are other types of mycorrhizal, or yeah, of mycorrhizal fungi that we can't see. Um, so I'm just gonna focus on this type that we can see. And, and in part two of the module where you're gonna be analyzing data, all of the roots um, in those photos came from species that do associate with mycorrhizal fungi. So I wanna be clear that like not all plants associate with ectomycorrhizal fungi. It's only usually um, conifers and some deciduous trees um, and, and other types other plants in the world associate with different types of mycorrhizal fungi, but not the ecto kind, um, like ecto meaning outside. So one of, so like I mentioned earlier, um, one of the main reasons that plants associate with these fungi is because they help 
gather nutrients from the soil. And the hyphae, like I said, are so thin that they can get into pockets of soil that even the fine root hairs couldn't access. And so it just increases the surface area and the ability for plants to find those nutrients in the soil. Um, and another reason, um, or another way that ectomycorrhizae help the plant is by providing some protection from other soil pathogens and um, freezing temperatures, believe it or not. So in the Arctic, in Greenland, all of the mycorrhizae, uh, most of the, the mycorrhizal fungi there are ectomycorrhizae um, because they, they help um, with some protection, protecting the roots. Um, but I will, I want to be really clear here. This isn't like, the mycorrhizal fungi is helping the plant on purpose. It gets very much a push and pull of both parties gaining something. So they're not being nice to each other. This is um, an evolutionary advantage for both parties that has evolved. So these, these mycorrhizal fungi evolved from decomposer fungi. So other fungal species in ecosystems, they specialize on growing on dead organic matter. So they um, also, you know, spit out enzymes into the soil that chop up organic matter and then they can absorb that nutrient, those nutrients and the carbon. These mycorrhizal fungi have just evolved to get their carbon from plants um, so that they're no longer getting that carbon from the soil. They're only getting nutrients from the soil. Um, okay, so Time to move on to our third breakout group. So what, two things, what environmental factors might affect mycorrhizae? And then what things in soil could affect mycorrhizae? So this is where you should pause and in your breakout groups, make hypotheses or predictions um, within these two questions. Um, and then when you are ready to resume after, after 10 minutes or so, um, just come back to the video and we'll wrap up. <clears throat> okay, so this is the end of module part one. Um, in module part two, you will be using the, uh, the 20 root photos that I've provided that I dug up in my backyard, which happens to be forest. And uh, there is a second video where I go over how to do the mycorrhizal um, analysis and do the counting. And so, um, and there's also um, a spreadsheet where you'll be entering your data. Um, so happy soil sampling. Um, when you get to module part three, you will be digging up um, a root and comparing with your classmates um, and noting down some observations and making a few measurements. So with that, um, this is also just my favorite Calvin Hobbes comic. It's great. So I'll stop sharing. And um, again, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, bye.